viewers and welcome to Calypso Showcase, the tune Pan in E minor, composed by the Lord Kitchener and played by Ace Arranger Les St. Paul in a special way. And that he happens to be our special guest tonight on Calypso Showcase. Well, welcome, Les and, and perhaps we can start by talking about that classical approach to Pan in E minor. What prompted that? But it was something spontaneous, you know. I was working out in the studio and I was kind of bored with a project that I was doing. And I decided to kill time. Let me just try something. And my, my brother, I remember, he was there and uh, put on a reel tape. And I said, let me try playing Pan and Mine in, in classic. And that is how it came about. Have you ever thought of scoring it? Because I think it would be an excellent piece for, say, our youth. Simply use orchestra to play or something like that. Yeah, I thought about that a lot of times. A few um, kids came to me one time, asked me for the music scores, but I was so busy I couldn't really um, do the scoring for them. Mm -hmm. what, what, what I did, I remember that I took the tape and I took all the parts, the different parts, and I put it on a separate tape. Each part? Yeah, each part. But I still think that you should score yeah. it out and publish it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to talk first of all about uh, this new um, LP that you've just put out. Just this weekend, I was hearing some of the tunes on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the title, Less Than Paul, For Real. For real. For Tell real. me a little bit about it. Well, um, we started this album after Carnival, and it have all, most of the tunes on it uh, from 1995 Carnival, and um, the musicians are from Trinidad, well, everybody basically. And um, I guess the public would like it, especially the cut that I did, did over with Tony Braxton tune, um, You Mean the World to Me. Is that done in a soca style? Exactly. And, and you have what, the normal soca party mix? What are some of the tunes that you've chosen? Well, I've chosen um, Marshall's tune, uh, this band with Steve Seeley, Breakaway, um, Right, Blue Boy, uh, Chandeliers, the Bajan part of it with ring bang. Cassandra and the ring bang beat. I did a house mix of that. And well, basically what has been here in, during the carnival time. How, how much of a demand is this type of um, LP now that carnival is over? It's in demand a lot because, um, well, you know, Byron Lee used to do it before a long time, mm -hmm. you know, and um, since then, I started it, and um, Kenny Phillips also, he, he, he started doing the same thing. And people look forward to it after the carnival. It's like getting carnival at 95 in a package. Tell me something about your travels. I know you spend a lot of time in and out of Trinidad. Where have you been already for the year? Where are you going to be in the next few months? <laughs> well, for the year, I've been to Aruba. I've been to St. Martin. I've been to Barbados. I've been to New York. Well, that's my second home, New York and back. And I'll be traveling extensively this year also, doing projects back and forth in different studios. Well, our main reason for bringing Lester on the program is to, to look a little bit at, at his musical life. So we'll take a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll journey up to his studio in Champlain. Well, let's start at the very beginning. Um, how did you get into music? Well, let's go way back. Way, 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 way back. As far as I could recall, I always play music. You know, since a small age, I always like beaten pans. The people around QF area would, would tell you because uh, every time you pass on 12 Bellsmile Street, no matter what time of the day or night, you must hear me either beaten pan downstairs or playing uh, makeshift drum set I used to use home. And maybe a little uh, xylophone my uh, aunt bought me because at that time we really couldn't afford any piano or such. Mm -hmm. So there everything really started. What formal training do you have in music? Well, when I was at the age of 15 years, I started to take lessons at uh, Miss Blake, a teacher called Miss Blake, right in my same street there on Bells, my Street in Kirep. And I did theory there up to grade six. And then I went to New York and I did some more studies with improvisation and stuff, jazz improvisation and chord changes. It was like a, a one-year one year course. And then um, well, during the, that time afterwards, I came back to Trinidad and I started to 
arranged and stuff. But before I left, I used to work with Ben Romani. Uh, if you know Ben Cook, right, Kikumba Music Publishing Company. That was actually my first job when I left school because I was, I came searching for some avenues that I could do music full time and I didn't realize that it was so hard. But that I had gone to PRS with some songs that I wrote and they sent me across to Ben Romani and then he told me about the whole music business in a nutshell and he told me, well, it's something that he had to gradually take step by step. So he hired me as a, a copyist and notator. So I worked there for a while and there I met Funny and I met Shadow. So everything kind of like took a, a took some time to where am I now. When did you first get attracted to, let's say, the indigenous music of Trinidad and Tobago? Well, actually it was while I was working at Kikumba Music because like um, seeing all the artists passing through because at that time a lot of the artists had published their tune with, tunes with Kikumba Music. And uh, Earl Rodney, I remember, he was the one that um, told me that I should get into arranging. At that time, I wasn't arranging as yet. He told me that it has more money in arranging than just being a, a player. You know, so I took it upon myself to um, to pursue that that um, that course. And there's a guy from the police band called Willard Paul. We're not related, but um, I end up playing in his band, and he gave me some books on arranging and stuff with harmonies and voices for the various instruments, and. In the, in the week or so, I was arranging for the band. Uh, have you played with any local bands in the, say, the early 70s or anything like that? Well, my parents didn't allow me to really play with any band until I left school, which it was a good. But um, after that, Tropical Ambassadors was one of the first bands that I played with. That was the same leader, Willard Paul. He was um, the leader of that band. Then I played with majors, just gigs here and there with them. I wasn't really part of the band, but anytime they needed a keyboard player on shows and stuff, I'd play. And, well, I used to do a lot of st studio work at a, at a, t a certain time, too. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with any steel bands? Well, actually, there was a steel band in Tanapuna. I can't remember their name right now. I did some work with them because uh, when the school up there, and there are some guys who we used to hang out with after lunch, or not uh, not after lunch, during the lunch time, we would like go to his house and we would like be playing and stuff and the steel band was right next to him. So when I left school, they asked me to do some arrangements and, and stuff for them. And I did it in 76 or 77, I can't remember what year, the same year that that Shadow had a um, bass man. Mm -hmm. And I come out to play. Yeah, I played drums for Kirep Shuzando that year. Because that was, was 1974, I think. 74? Yeah. Okay. I was more into drums than, than keyboards. keyboards at that time, yeah. What would you say was the first significant tune that you did the full arrangement of? Well, what really stuck in my mind from way back then is that um, Duke album called Harps of Gold, which was really a, a Stepping stone, because um, I was I was pretty young and I was kind of shy in the sense that um, I found that the responsibility of doing an album was like a a big whole lot of pressure on me because at that time after the Koto and um, Ed Watson they was the guys around that time you know and Drew. He was kind of like a crazy man to come out of the blue to ask me to arrange mm -hmm. arrange his album, you know. So that album, we it always stick in my mind as a, a one of those um, works that I always uh, appreciate and go back and always listen to it to to, to feel me. Thank you. 
Well, I did hear a symphony. Say me up, say me up. Oh, gosh. When you say it's not bad, it's a good place to do it. developing from the tunes of the image and the type of music that people associate with the man less than Paul? Well, I, I got to find out what is commercial music and to have a commercial ear and to do commercial uh, arrangement because that is something I couldn't really understand because I was so into, I was into stuff like movie, like writing for movies and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Is that what I wanted to do at one time but um i realized that there was something about the commercial aspect of the music that i'd love and um when i started to work with the calypsonians like mudada and juke and stuff and then i started to hear the change that that um, the calypso music was taken where shorty now came into the picture and the music was evolving into something new you know, I always had my ear listening out on the radio for, for different things and trying sometimes even to emulate other arrangers because I was trying to get a space inside. I see. So you find that some of my arrangements had a little bit of Ed, a little bit of Adikoto, mm -hmm. you understand? So that's about it. Tell me something about working with someone like, say, Lord Kitchener, because I think a lot of people have felt that um, your working with him has brought out the best of his music. Tell me about working with the Lord Kitchener. Well, I must say the Lord Kitchener, he's a great artist and musician as well. He has a fantastic ear. You know, like uh, he's one of the few guys who you work with and he will actually tell you that there's a wrong note somewhere inside and there's a wrong chord that you're playing, you know. And that amazed me so much because, I mean, a lot of people didn't know Kitchener as a, a, bass, a bass player. And um, sometimes when he come to my home to arrange some of his tunes, he would like be singing these jazz bass lines in his head, especially the pan songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, he, he, he's bad. And I think with the pan songs that he used to do, it was up my alley, you know, because of the different chord changes and stuff. Because sometimes to you, as a musician, you get fed up of doing tune to just two chords and three chords. Mm -hmm. So you want to take the music to a higher height and you, wanna, you want people to know how much you know musically. <laughs>
one time, um, as you mentioned, um, the two chords, um, Chalk the Sang of Calypso, two chords, and less than Paul alluding to the fact that uh, you were sort of putting out like canned music or something like that for some of the lesser um, creative Calypsoians. How do you feel about that comment? Well, um, it was true to a point because I think um, a lot of people have taken me for granted sometimes. Like when they come to do their work, they would like leave everything. They would come with anything and say, use less than Paul, man. This, this, once you touch this, it will surely be a hit. So you find that they really wasn't working much like with their lyrics and stuff. So they was fully dependent on the music that I was giving them, you know. They were just in like three lines, two lines on music. Mm -hmm. And the whole, sometimes like the whole um, two minutes inside will, I will fill it up with brass lines and horn lines and, mm -hmm. and stuff, you know. And they would say, well, look, I have a bad record, man. My, my record is, is a hit because of the music that that is in it, you know. And I think that um, because of that, uh, I guess, Chuck just wrote that song. <laughs> <laughs> this studio, when did it come into being? Well, I would say we started the studio back in 89. It took a year to build. Before, prior to that, I had a, um, I used to work in a, my home studio when I was in San Augustine, in a little back room. And we did some, we did some hits out of that room was amazing. You know, it's from there I realized that home studio was be coming to be a norm eventually. Mm -hmm. So when I moved down here, I um I brought the B room across on that side of the studio there on the southern side and we worked out of there. The hits that we did there was like Wine Your Waste, Mama. Um Tony Barclay did a song with a merchant a merchant composition, um One Superpower. One superpower. Mm -hmm. For the destruction and terror, they want to rule the world. They want to take control, carrying on as if they own the universe. They put human rights last and warfare, yeah, yeah. but we must have no fear for the nuclear energy. For there's one more powerful and mighty, and he has dominion over all. I say, we have to answer when he calls. You know why? Because there is one, one superpower. We don't have one, one superpower. And he's the master. The creator of the heaven and earth. Iowa George, he had a couple of hits from there. Nap Hepburn. We, we, we did a lot of stuff. Charlene's first hit, um, I Love Manani, we did it in that room too. Mm -hmm. And um, all that time, we was kind of like feeling out the recording industry. And then I decided that um, if I really want to take this thing seriously, I have to go state of the art. Mm -hmm. So we started to build this room. This and that part over there for the musicians and stuff. And Blen, right now we could use the two studios interlocking. You know, they could record here and we could take effects from there, or vice versa. So. We have a good setup here, but I don't like to be tied down. So although I have a studio here, that doesn't mean that I don't like to work in anybody else's studio because yeah. it's I think a, that's important. Yeah. You know, I love to work in New York. I love to, 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 to do studio work in New York because of many reasons. I always learn something when I'm up, up there, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I love to work in, in different environments. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it brings off. It brings out a different feel in the music as well as creativity from from within. Tell me something about Less Than Paul and the New York connection as you touched on New York. How did that come about and the first album with uh, Get Up and Dance? Well, actually I was uh, 
doing some recordings for Michael Gould. He had produced a lot of artists at the time there on B's label. And um, there's this guy called Hugh Loy who decided that um, he let me do a, an album with all the hits of Carnival. And he came up with the name The New York Connection. So The New York Connection actually was, um, is in fact myself and it was Lennox who was doing lead vocals because Lennox, he lived in New York and we used a lot of musicians from New York backgrounds and other, et cetera. And we, we started that vibe then, and you know, I, I'm still going strong up to now. Tell me about coming to touch with a guy like Lennox Piku and using him on the album. Well, Lennox is a great vocalist. He, he has a lot of experience, you know, because he, he was way back in those days with, with pop gear and stuff, you know, together with Elsworth James and stuff. And he, he's a nice guy to work with, you know. Right now, he's gone, he's pursuing a solo career solo career, so we're using other singers on, on the album. Who oh, hopefully we might do something with him this year. A lot of people you have worked with, but one of the persons who testifies as to your prowess is the mighty Trini, and um, he has a threesome of Devine's, Trini, and yourself. Talk about that special combination. Yeah, well, um, Trini, we go way back uh, since I used to live in Love Until There, where he had um, there's two songs that he brought, from one from Merchant and I think one from Devines. And then the following year, we did um, Curry to Banker. some of the other people that you've worked with that particularly stand out in your mind? Well, uh, Merchant, of course. I work with the Mighty Sparrow. Swallow, I did a streamline uh, hits for Solo. It had a time Solo had hits every year, you know, like Party in Space and, and um, Subway Jam and all those stuff. And Arrow, well, Arrow was, Arrow was a, a, a great experience simply because I learned a lot from Aro, being like a businessman. You know, I learned that aspect from him. I um, also learned to accept other people's point of view because we we used to work as a, a, a unit, you know. And um, he did a lot of stuff that stands out in my, that I would like to like, like 20 or 30 years from now, I would like to like take those records and redo those songs because when I listen to Hot 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 and Columbia Rock and a lot of stuff, I know. I mean, I would, wouldn't want to boast boast to myself, but I think um, being in Montreal for like a month and 
only here in one set of rooms in the head all all the time you know we he he got he was one of the persons that that got a lot of, out of me Well, we come to 1995 and uh, an aspect of you, I said, doing some adjudication for Panorama. I know, I think you've done it before. Tell me what was that experience like? Well, the experience at Panorama, it was a, a very nice experience. Um, the, what, what, what I would say about the whole uh, pa Panorama scenario that is um, it's something that these guys look forward to every year. You know, the bad thing about it is that after a pan player spends so much nights practicing a song over and over again, you know, for and then to come and just be uh, 10 minutes of glory mm -hmm. on the stage and after that for the balance of the year, you know, that is something that um, I can't really seem to come to grip with because it's so much of music and energy that these guys put out. I mean, going to be judged by myself, judges like myself and and the other judges on the panel, that's a good experience for me, but I'm more concerned about the pan as an instrument and the players more as musicians, not just as, as pan men, you know? So I think um, there should be something more than panorama that these guys could look forward to because it's it's too short it's too short a thing to put all that work into just for one night or two nights or maybe you might have a bad night that you're practicing good 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 you play and you get high points and then there's a night that I might be the judge mm -hmm. that night and you might be impressive to me correct you know and I know that the uh, results are official and we accept the results, but even sometimes when you are adjudicating their, their, their favorite or haunting memories of a particular tune or arrangement of a particular night that might stick with you, what stuck with you from 95 Panorama? Um, actually, when I go into judge like a Panorama competition, I try to put everything away from me. Like I have a lot of friends who is arrangers that play with arranging for certain bands and tunes that I did and stuff. So I try to be like neutral, mm -hmm. you know, and have a, a, a wide ear and li listen especially to those who doesn't get that attention. Because there was a band that um, impressed me very much that um, final night was Skiffle Bunch. <laughs>
approximately how many people from outside of Trinidad do you cater to in an, on an average every year? Um, a lot that could be hmm, roughly about, about 50 artists outside of Trinidad from St. Martin, Aruba, Antigua, Grenada, St. Vincent, Barbados, Montserrat, even Australia, we did a guy. <laughs> <laughs> we did a guy from Australia last year. He came all the way from Dongananda to record. Um, so I hope, hopefully, that um, we'll be taking music, the soca music, on a, a wider scale, you know, and trying my best enough, likewise, the musician and artists who work here, to try to set a certain standard to the music for it to be accepted. That's what everybody is waiting for. I know that you work. Exception. Yeah. I know that you work almost every day of the year. Who are you working with right now? Well, I'm working with a guy called Robbie from St. Vincent, Cockroach from Barbados, and a guy called Mr. D from Grenada. <laughs> for me so far in my career is like doing what I'm doing, you know, it's something that I wanted to do all my life. I never really wanted to be clocking in a card, you know, going to work eight to four and stuff. I could work when I want, stop when I want. Although when <laughs> when the neighborhood is sleeping, we're still working, you know, but I enjoy most of it. It's something that um, a lot a lot of people look forward to doing a job that they love. You know, that is where I think I have the advantage. Thank you. 